Joshua Branham, and I have the absolute pleasure of getting to interview and speak with Pastor Charlene of New Life International Church in Lima, Ohio. Before we even get into the interview, I just want to say, if y'all have never heard this woman of God pray, she is one that can, like, call down fire. She's one of those <laughs> surgical prayers that find a way to just, like, say, you be like, man, why didn't I think of that when I prayed? But Pastor Charlene, she really carries the mantle of prayer. And we mm -hmm. went to Lima one day for the Latter Rain Conference, and she taught a class on prayer and spiritual warfare. And there are still some things, even though mm -hmm. that was several years ago, that I still reference in my very own prayer life because it was that um, impactful and that powerful. So when I learned that she, was, that she had written and self-published, by the way, which is not an easy thing to do, her own book, I had to have my own copy, in which I do. So everybody, <laughs> welcome Pastor Charlene. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure. Yeah, so if you could, Pastor Charlene, um, can you just tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what your passions are? Certainly, it is a pleasure being here today and looking at all of your wonderful, smiley faces this early morning to worship the Lord. Uh, just a little backdrop. Um, I am from South America. You might have heard an accent. I don't hear an accent, <laughs> but lots of people tells me that I tell me that I have an accent. But I'm from South America, which is the only English speaking, only English speaking country in South America. All the South American countries speak English and maybe Portuguese or English and Spanish, but we only speak English, the British English that has traveled into a little bit of Caribbean mix there. But um, yes, I'm from South America, Guyana, just next to Brazil and Suriname, Venezuela, all around there. And um, <laughs> um, came up to the States about maybe about almost 30 years now and love it there. I've been, been married for 23 years and have one son and met my husband in Bible college. And I love that because we were on the same um, pursuit and that is following the will of God and ministry and all of that. So it was a good journey. It is a good journey. And one son was birthed out of that. So that's a little bit about me. A little bit. So can you tell us, how long have you been pastoring? I have, we've been pastoring the same time we've been married. Right as we got married, we were assigned a ministry in Columbus. And so it's been 23 years of pastoring wow. that we've been. So we had no break. As soon as we got <laughs> married, they threw, because we got married, we got engaged the day of our graduation. And then I think it's about eight months after we were married, and then they just kicked us on the ministry. So all of our ministry life has been our married life. So we learned everything on the field. Wow. <laughs> Can we just clap for 23 years of marriage and ministry? <laughs> that is, that's incredible because to, to be married and to have a healthy, happy marriage is one thing, but to try to balance that yeah. with ministry that's a that's a horse yeah. of another color. So yeah. that is that's commendable, and that is definitely something that I believe um, people in the body of Christ need to see. They need to see people happy. They need to see yeah. people in love. They need to see a, a husband and wife team that have found the rhythm and are able to yeah. balance yeah. Yeah. ministry yeah. and yeah. to do it effectively and yeah. to do it with joy in serving the Lord and that it doesn't become cumbersome yeah. or laborious yeah. in doing yeah. that. So that's, that's, that's commendable. Yeah. I look it's up been that. a journey. It's yeah. been a journey. I think it has been a, a melting pot of everything, tears and joy and learning and, and making mistakes and falling and getting up, wanting to give up and then having to start over. It's been a mixture of everything. But the beauty about it is that with every step, there has been lessons. With every step, there has been teachings from the Lord. And it, it, was up to up, it was up to us to grasp those and learn them or else we had to do them over again. And again. And I hate to do, I hate to fail a test. But sometimes when you're taking a test and you don't know it's a test, sometimes you don't approach it like a test. You see, but when you know it's a test, my goodness, you prepare for it. Well, guess what? None of it we knew was a test. So we had to just 
just live it out. And it was a journey. Sometimes it affected your marriage. Sometimes it affected your prayer life. Sometimes it affected your relationships. There was hurts. There was everything along the journey. But all in all, I would not give it up for anything in this world. I love what I do. Um, I sent another book. Um, <laughs> That was incredible. <laughs> so, so you've been married for 23 years, mm -hmm. and you've been in ministry for 23 years. Mm -hmm. At what stage in your ministry did you really develop the passion and the burden for prayer? That is a very profound question. Um, I got saved at 15. And growing up in a culture, in a setting where Pentecostalism was very foreign to us, we grew up in a more Anglican setting, just very similar to Catholics. So growing up in that Anglican setting, uh, my parents were Anglicans. And so when I got saved, I was one of the first generational Christians in our home wow. and my entire family. My uncle had gotten saved years before and he had gone off into ministry. Well, I had never known that because I never heard of Pentecostalism until the missionaries went to Guyana. And so when I got saved, it, it really created a lot of upheaval in our home. My mom did not embrace it. Loud, boisterous, um, derogatory style of worship was just not in keeping with our pious, you know, way of doing it. And so it, it put a lot of pressure on me at home. It was, it was very, very difficult. And being in a church setting where I saw the older women and I saw the, the young girls, young people were getting saved and, and just God was just doing so much in their lives that I was just gravitating towards the church more and more. And there's nothing they could have done to stop me <laughs> from being in the church. And so the, the more the pressure turned on at home is the more my prayer life was turning on. Wow. And so 5 o'clock in the morning, after I saw how the young people and the older ladies prayed, I started developing that at 15. So I will, and I came from a big family, so there was no quietness in our house. Eight brothers and sisters, so there was always noise. I had to find a place to pray. And my place was up in a mango tree in our backyard. In the backyard, hiding under my mother's garden. And I will be there, and I will be zeroing in to God. Because there was a consciousness that I wanted to see my family saved. I carried such an immense burden to see my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters come to know Jesus that I prayed it through. There were times I remember praying from about 10 o'clock at night until 6 in the morning, just praying through. And then I was in an environment after I get to meet my uncle where I had to leave home and I would stay. I lived at them for a while. And I've never seen two people pray like this in my entire life. Every morning, every, they were my alarm clock, five o'clock. Him and his wife started praying for hours every single day. And so that developed a thirst and an and intensity for prayer. So that's where it all started, long story short. Long story, but good story. The, <laughs> the profound thing about that story that really blessed me is that in your pressure and in your, mm -hmm. you know, in your situation, that it didn't, it could have developed in, yeah. in, in a yeah. multitude of different things. Yeah. You know, it could have produced bitterness in you, it yeah. could have produced anger or resentment in you, but the fact that it pushed you to have that desire to be compelled yeah. to pray, yeah. I think is very profound, and I mm -hmm. think a lot of people can use that that mm -hmm. revelation to when we're in situations sometimes God allows those things mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he's trying to produce a prayer a hunger for yes, prayer yes, a prayer language yes, and a prayer yes. life in you versus us you know becoming offended yeah, yeah, you know yeah. when someone offends <laughs> us we immediately like okay well I don't want to be friends with them anymore well maybe God is pushing you to pray for that person pray, pray so that's it. profound and that mm -hmm. that blessed me immensely and I'm sure mm -hmm. everyone else can testify to that 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 was I think that's something that's very important, especially as a 15-year-old girl. Like, yeah. how many 15-year-old girls you know go through that amount of, of trial, but yeah. then th they are compelled to pray, mm -hmm. and it produces such a diamond in them. So Praise amen God. to that. Praise God. Praise that's amazing. God. Yeah. Amazing. So, so you developed your, your passion for prayer around 15. When did you 
kind of get the passion to begin writing? I'll tell you where I got that from. Um, I was in, we don't have grades like you have it here, first grade, second grade. We would have standard one, standard two, standard three, and then when you get to um, form one, form two. So I was in fourth form, which was somewhere around maybe 17 or so. And my mom, trying her very best, she felt like you didn't need school anymore. I would teach you to be a seamstress because I always had a knack for art and, and she was a professional seamstress. So she said to me, you know, honey, you should stay home and I'll teach you to sew. But deep inside of me, I knew there was great. I knew there was more, but I wanted to obey my mom. I was determined that my life was gonna shine for my parents at whatever cost. And so she took me out of high school which was fourth, fourth, fourth form. And uh, she kept me home for about a month. And then like one of my teachers missed me and he sent a friend, which we all connected on Facebook now. Would you believe that? <laughs> she sent a friend, he sent a friend to get me. So I was so excited when I saw Jennifer Whitehead come to my door and you know, told me that Mr. Walcott needs to see me. So I went into school the next day and he met me right at the door and he said to me, why aren't you in school? And I said, Mr. Walcott, my mom wants me to be a seamstress. And he said something to me that drove me into, uh, I mean, he was like a, just a motivator. He said, even as a seamstress, you're gonna need to learn to add, you're gonna need to learn to read, and you're gonna need, need to learn to manage your money. So you need all these subjects, so you need to be in school. And he said, what do you like to do most? And I already loved writing short stories and reading short stories. So I told him, I said, I love to write. And he said, I want you today to join the school's newspapers. And I want you to start writing articles for the newspapers. And from since then, that thing was inside of me to write. My mother was a good writer. My grandmother, they were all good writers. All of my nieces are. And so this thing was always inside of me to write, but it never happened until now. That thing that God puts inside of you, and I want to talk to somebody today. That thing, that dream that God put inside of you, that somehow situations, trials, people might have caused it to be covered, Search inside of you again and find it. Whatever it is God placed in your heart from years ago. Because as working with a coach recently, I'd forgotten about this. And working with a coach recently, she said, Charlene, dream. I said, dream? Shoo, I, I, what, 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 what to dream? I said, I hadn't dreamt for so long. She said, dream, dream. What is it the dreams you had as a young girl? And I remember that conversation with Mr. Walcott. And I told her, I said, I enjoy writing. She said, find it and write again. And that's when I started saying, oh my gosh, it is still there. God put it there and nothing could have removed it. All the trials and the testings and all, nothing could have removed it. That dream remained in there. What is it you have inside of you that is hidden, that nobody knows dancing? Speaking, cooking, what is it? I believe God has it inside of you for a purpose. Wow. That just spoke to somebody in here today. It's one thing you said that kind of caught my attention is you said that your mother was a writer, your grandmother is a writer, and all your nieces is a writer. So it's like a generational gift mm -hmm. that God given, has given your family, mm -hmm. and you were the one that actually stepped out. You that's stepped right. out, and you broke the mold, and that's you... Right. You started writing for God, and you that's wrote a book, right. and that's, that is incredible. And I believe that God does that with us sometimes. Yeah. You look at families, and you see lineages of people that can sing, that mm -hmm. are creative, that can do mm -hmm. this and do that, and he's just waiting for that one person, one person that is going to say, okay, God, I trust you. It sounds a little crazy, but I'm going to step out, and I'm yeah. going to do this thing yeah. that you've <laughs> given me because you won't be satisfied if you don't do it, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that is incredible. I'm glad Praise you – I'm so glad that you <laughs> stepped out. I'm excited about more books that you're going to write. Yes. But before we jump that gun, <laughs> tell me about this, this book you have. You sure you want to know? I do. I do. <laughs> this book is called 
31 prayers that move the hand of God. And this book came out of a very hard place. Very, very hard place in my life. I will say this book started on the carpet with much tears in my house last year. Where I felt like God was shifting me in my life. That my season was changing. I remember getting up in the mornings and saying to the Lord, life just seems so blah, you know. There was nothing to it anymore. I, I was mastering what I was doing. I was, I was comfortable. I was, everything seemed, and it just seemed, I used to say, maybe am I going to die like this? Am I going to die uh, so unfulfilled, not fulfilling this something that is inside of me? I didn't know what the something was and how I was going to find it. But when people look at me, they saw all the greatness, but I couldn't. And I went into, somebody said something to me that threw me into a place of heavy depression. Heavy, it was tough. And so I found myself really crying out to God. When the going gets tough for me, Sister Tasha, I find myself on the carpet. I cannot, I don't stand to pray. I can't even kneel to pray. I have to lie to pray. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see me under the pews under the chairs. That's, that's my posture. And that's where this book started. These prayers in this book are prayers that I prayed literally. And I just felt the Lord say, just write them down. The prayer of unforgiveness, the first one, I was carrying unforgiveness in my heart, to be very honest with you, because of what was said to me. And I was angry that something like that, and just, I can't even go into all the details, but the ramifications. It was so heavy. And so I was angry. I was very angry. I was angry at everybody. Um, and then you had to keep your posture as a pastor. You had to keep everything together as a leader. But, but everything inside of you was just bleeding. Bleeding. And you had your armor on, but underneath that armor, honey, there was blood everywhere. There was, there was pokes everywhere. And I just lay before God, and I wouldn't get up until I got clearance. So day after day, my poor husband had to be in the room and hear this bawling, and <gasps> hallelujah, just crying out to God because I felt that is my place. If I, don't, if I don't tap into the presence of God, if I don't tap into the anointing of God, I can't move forward. In fact, I felt like I should move in a different direction. And I had everything planning. I was going to do these conferences. And, and in my time of prayer, the Holy Spirit said, no, that's not what I want. Leave it. This is what I want. Oh and I had to take a shift. And I told my husband, I said, let's forget the conference. Let's forget all of that. I'm going to write this book. And so this book came out of just a dry place. And God birthed this on prayer. And I, I did not dream or expect it to take off the way it has. So it's been good. Wow. <laughs> so you said several things <laughs> in that time. You know, I admire that you were really able to discern the voice of God and push mm -hmm. aside what you have planned mm -hmm. to pursue what he says. Because we always have this neat little, you know, plan of, beginning, middle, and end, and this is how I'm going to oh, approach yeah. this. This is what I'm oh, going to yeah. do. This is how I'm <laughs> going to raise the money. We'll go here. We'll do this. And it's all mapped out perfectly, so yeah. we think. But God always has an alternate route. He always has other yeah. plans, and they never make sense. Mm -hmm. But when you follow and you be obedient and do what he tells you to do, the provision is there, and his blessing is there because his hand is on it. Amen. So Amen. I believe really that this book is really going to shift yeah. some things because Great I believe that there's a prayer that needs to hit, this, hit the church, that needs to Great hit soul. this country that is really needed. So I believe he's Great raising soul. up prayer warriors like yeah. you to kind of, you know, ignite the fire in yes. us. Praise God. So, so in your devotional, if you could pick, you know, maybe a handful of prayers that are your absolute favorite. Maybe there's one uh, prayer, whether it's unforgiveness or something that is more of a burden to you. What would you say those prayers are? You know, to be honest with you, there's several of them. There are quite a lot of them that really are. I remember writing them. I remember the m emotions that I felt. As I was writing them, I remember some of them tears were running down my eyes as I was writing them. I remember when anger was lurking in my spirit 
when I was writing them and saying, and this, this particular one, if I can just, can I read this? Yes, if I can just read this to you, Lord, I didn't put my glasses here. But tell me if you bring my glasses, I'll see better so I can read. But this one, this, this heart of forgiveness, number one, it was, oh my goodness. And the, the thing about it, that as I write this prayer, I was writing them like I was praying them. It was, it was real for me. Everything that I wrote in this prayer, it was like I was reading. I was, I was crying it out to the Father. For me, um, Minister Tasha, I prefer to be real than to put on a, a front that is not there. I prefer that. And so as I, as I was writing this prayer, it was who I really was at that moment. It was how I felt. And so you're going to hear a lot almost, it sounds so personal. And what is amazing is that as people bought the book and they were reading it, they said, this is how I would want to pray. This is how it sounded. So if I can pray this for you. It says, Lord, within myself, I cannot forgive. I cannot forgive because the pain is too deep. I hurt so badly that my, my vocabulary seems limited to express my true pain. I feel helpless right now, but I, I know that you are a forgiving God. I run to you for help, Lord. Please help me. Help me to forgive those that have hurt me. And, oh, God has inflicted such pain in my heart. It says, Lord, I submit my heart to you. I needed to do it because my heart was hurting so badly. I said, Lord, I submit my heart to you. And I ask you to make it pliable. To your Holy Spirit. Massage my heart. Make it tender towards you. Hallelujah. Make my heart to respond to love and forgiveness. Help me to let go of anger and unforgiveness. I surrender my hurts and my disappointments to you. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. According to Psalm 51 verse 1 through 12. And I said anything the spirit of unforgiveness wants. Anything time the spirit of unforgiveness wants to seep into my heart because I found it was coming and going you don't just get it over it's a process and that's why the Holy Spirit has to keep working on you I felt this thing seeping into my spirit one time I'm free and I can talk and laugh and the next time I just get so heavy that this thing came on me and so I said father Anytime this spirit of unforgiveness wants to seep into my heart, please bring to my remembrance the fact that you have forgiven me over and over again. I said, Father, please fill my heart with forgiveness and love and let those who have hurt me know that I'm a true Christian. That was important to me, that they know that I'm a true Christian because of my response. And so I had to bring that to the Father. I said, Father, because of my unconditional love. And I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you my heart to take it. And this prayer, believers, I remember sitting in the chair with my pajamas on and writing it and saying, God, help me, help me. And then there were prayers here for the family. As I began thinking about my family, I began protecting my family under the blood of Jesus. Then I began thinking about my son and his, his future wife. And I began writing prayers for my daughter-in-law and for God to choose her wherever she is. That God would begin to massage her just like I am massaging my son. What I'm putting into my son, I want her mother to put into her. And I began to pray for that. Then I think of my dear husband and how the protection of God must be on him. So I began to write prayers for my husband and the many, many pastors' wives and, and women that need that protection of God on their hearts and lives. And there is the last prayer, the second to last one. It was a prayer on uh, for suicide. And you might say, Pastor, why would you have a prayer of suicide in this book? The day that this prayer was written was a, 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 one of our ladies from the church called. She was broken. And there was a suicide that had just occurred that day in our city. 
a young man went to his basketball or football, whichever game it was, baseball, and hung himself right at the game. And this thing devastated the young people of our city so badly. And as I prayed for that mother, I said, how many young people are being paralyzed? Their destiny is being altered because the enemy has stepped in with a spirit of suicide to abduct these kids and their future and their hope and their destiny. And so that's how the spirit of suicide was brought before the father that day. And that's how that prayer was written. The, the prayer against the spirit of suicide. So one after the other, every one of these prayers were directed by the Father. Every one of these prayers were specific, and each one of them had a reason. Some of them never entered. Some prayers never entered this book. These are the ones that I felt the Holy Spirit gave me. But I tell you, the top one was the, the prayer of unforgiveness. What is amazing, Tasha, if I may just drop this. I started a... Bible study with the women of our church over this book. And the first one we did is the prayer of unforgiveness. So I actually prepare a Bible study because I'm going, to be pro I'm going to be producing a Bible study to match this. And that's going to be coming out in the spring. I'm working on that right now. And so as I'm preparing that, I had the ladies go over this. Honey, it was one of the most powerful Bible studies I've ever conducted in my life. It was amazing to see the people that sit in this congregation. How many of them that lift their hands and worship God are dealing with this real spirit of unforgiveness. Somebody abduct, um, molested you. Somebody hurt you. Some, and they're carrying it. One lady said to me, Pastor, how do I forgive my husband? I'm living with him every day, and I'm seeing what he's doing. I'm dealing with it momentarily. How do I deal with that? And that's the realness of this book, because it's touching hearts and lives just where people are at. And that's why it is selling so much. I believe it. I felt the power <laughs> just from you, you know, Praise talking God. and reading the prayer of unforgiveness. Um, I've read you know, a couple of books on prayer, but I can really feel the presence of God. I can feel the anointing on that book, that the prayers are really targeted. They're really, um, they're strategic. They are praying the word of God. And I believe they're praying the heart of God. You know, I think that's very important when, um, when we're praying is that we're actually praying what's the burden of God's heart. What is it about prayer that moves God? Praise God. That that is a that's a good question. The, the the name of it is that that the prayer that moved the hand of God. If you notice how the, especially that first one, is I talk to God for real. You know, I tell him the truth. I'm I'm hurting. I'm angry for real. I'm not buttering it up to go to the Father to try to pretend to him, Father, could you just help me to free? No, Father, I'm hurting. I'm, I'm angry. I'm angry with somebody. I'm angry. This is how I feel. And when I pray, I, I shut myself in and understand it's, this is me and Father's business. This is between me and Father. And Father knows me more than I know myself. And when I don't even understand how I feel, sometimes I just cry it out to Father. And just, just, just sometimes just weep because the thing I love about it is that he understands our language. You see, man understands English and Spanish and Portuguese and every language on this earth, there is somebody that can interpret it. You think about it. French, there's somebody that can interpret French. Italian, there's somebody that can interpret Italian. Every language on this earth, man can interpret it. But there's one language, my God, today. There is one language man cannot interpret. It's only the Father can, and that's our tears. And so when you get before God, give, give him your real heart. Just, just be authentic before him and cry out to him because I believe when we pray heaven stops and listens when we pray I believe that I believe when God's people pray I believe when God's people begin to intensify you know the thing about prayer I think about prayer as the tabernacle 
The process it took to get from the outer courts to the Holy of Holies is a journey. It takes a while, and each one of them have a step. And sometimes when we pray, we think we sprint from the, the outer court into the Holy of Holies where the presence of the Lord is. But it takes waiting on God. Sometimes it takes a, a process, just waiting on him. And you know when you enter into that place. You know when the Spirit of the Lord ministers. You know, you know. And I think the thing about it that, 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 that hinders us sometimes from allowing God to move, it's we don't wait it out. I think that is the thing that many times we, we are in a hurry. 10 minutes, 50 minutes, I'm ready to go. Sometimes the Lord isn't ready yet. Sometimes it takes him half an hour, an hour. Sometimes it takes him two hours to really get through to you. And when you get in his presence, honey, the time flies and you don't even know three hours have passed. And that's what I believe when you enter into a certain place with the Father. You know it. You, you know it. When you enter into that place. I'm not talking about any 10 minutes prayer. 10 minutes prayer is good. And that doesn't mean God can answer your prayer. In five minutes. In a minute. He can. But if we're talking, my goodness, about moving Father's hand. And seeing him represent you on levels you only imagine. Just, just. Things that even come into your heart. When we go, sometimes I'm afraid to pray. When I see the spirit of God move, just shift things. It just amazes me. So it is, it is patience. It is waiting in his presence. And I believe that's what moves his hand. And I say this book is a book of patience. It is not a book to read and put down. That's not, that's not what this is. If you're going to read it and put it down, then don't even bother to get it. This is something that you go over and over before Father because unforgiveness stirs over and over and over again, and you constantly have to come before the Father. Praise God. Yes, wow. That's powerful. You just gave us a really powerful strategy on prayer because oftentimes we just pray the one time and that's it. Mm -hmm. We don't wait. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, wait on the presence of God to yeah. show up. We are not... Um, diligent and going back and yeah. knocking and knocking and knocking on heaven's door and beating and beating on God's mm -hmm. chest um, when we are plagued with a thing. So that is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So how can this devotional really enhance our lives, our, our personal prayer lives and our mm -hmm. corporate prayer lives as believers? Mm -hmm. uh, that's very good. Um, it's not a magic. It's not like you pray the prayer of, there's one here um, for unforgiveness. There's one here for grandchildren. It's not magic. Prayer is not magic. Prayer is not like a bellboy. You're at a hotel and you just press the bell. You know, I remember our son when he was younger. So funny, he would go to, when we go to hotels, he would press the operator and he would put on a British accent. And he would tell them what he needs. And they would bring it up quickly. To him. That's not what prayer is. Where I am trying to tap into God to, to get God to do what I want. Prayer is relational. It's you building a relationship with the Father. I want heaven to know me when I pray. I want heaven to be familiar with me. Because of my familiarity with heaven. Because I'm constantly going there. I want it to, I want it to be that thing that. That the Holy Spirit says, oh, she's praying. Or the devil says, oh, Lord, have mercy. I've got I've to make this. That's what I want this book to be. It's not magical. So when you buy it, it doesn't mean your husband is misbehaving or whatever. And so I'm going to pray this prayer over you. Uh, no, this is not what this is. Uh, it's not what that is. It's a time when you recognize, and even in your personal devotion, like you're praying for your pastors. You spend time praying these prayers over and over again until sometimes you may not even realize this particular line. I didn't, it didn't, it didn't resonate with me before. But after the fifth time, it was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly how I'm feeling. So it is something that I say, do it in groups. Do it in families. Do it like you're in college. Do it with some of your friends. Let's pray for our, our, our mothers. 
Let's pray for our homes, especially our generation. Let's pray for our children and our children's children and a thousand generation. Let's pray this prayer on them. So you can use this on so many levels. Um, like I said, one of the things that I'm doing is Bible study. Sit down and discuss these prayers. And what it does, it becomes personal. It becomes applicable. You can bring it home to your own life now. Or you may know someone that is in a situation where one of these prayers can really work for them. And you pass it on and then tell them, don't put it by your bedside. And leave it there. And only when you want to pray, you pick it up. These prayers is not something where you're taking my prayers and you're praying them. These prayers are becoming contextualized. Where it becomes your prayer to the Father. So when I say, in the name of Jesus, do it for me, you're praying it for you. And that's what this is about. It's personal. It's your thing. It's relational between you and Father. That's what prayer is about. Re that relationship with you and the Father. Intimacy. That's what the Father loves. He loves intimacy and relationship. And when he sees that you're going after him, and if you can do it in your private, you see, it's not a public prayer, Minister Tasha. That's fine. Anybody can pray public, huh? I can pray like the, scri the, the, the um, Pharisees uh, and the scribes and really make my prayers so eloquent. But heaven didn't even notice. Heaven continue doing what they were doing. Because I don't even have a prayer life in private. But if I have a time with the Father, when every day Father can come, and the two of us can spend time together then when i'm in public it's not hard to flow and now i long to see i long to see in our churches a movement of prayer initiated where our little ones learn to pray where our teenagers learn to pray where our mothers learn to pray and our fathers Learn to pray. It's a burning desire that I have to see it happen in our churches. If prayer becomes a movement in our churches and in the United States, some of the things we're dealing with, we wouldn't have to. I believe that. I agree. I agree. So before we wrap up, um, can you speak to the people here and to those that maybe watching and just what is on your heart what is burdening you what can you speak to them what can you declare to them and speak over them concerning prayer and how that can change the direction of their life or their ministry or whatever it is they're going through what could you say prophetically to the people i will say to you prayer is not for just a special group of people it's not for holy people just for people like Pastor Tash and myself, pastor's wives. and No, don't let anybody fool you. It's just not for intercessors. You can be an intercessor. Anybody prayer is for. Prayer is for you. But as you yearn for God, you tell yourself, I want some intimacy with the Father. And I'm going to designate a particular time every day to spend with the Father. Like at 15, 5 o'clock was my day. Because I know there was so much clutter in the day because I had a big family. So if I didn't get up at 5 o'clock, my day was gone. And because I developed that rhythm and a habit, prayer should become a habit. It should become natural. Just like how I eat lunch, dinner, it's natural. Or I take a shower every morning. and every My goodness, that's what prayer should be. Your body should just automatically navigate towards prayer every day day because you have practiced it mm? so i will encourage you make it a habit whatever you do that is important to you becomes a habit if prayer is important to you let it become a habit don't you be worried about the fact that you can't pray for an hour you start off at five minutes start off where you are and just increase just like working out you know i've been out at the gym for about two or three months and then i went back this week Honey, hmm. 
I just couldn't get on that, that elliptical and pull that hour like I was. Five minutes, I'm like, I'm ready to go. But I said, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to do 10. And then the next day, I'm going to do 15. And by the end of the week, I was up to about 30. And that's what prayer is, is you just practicing God's presence daily. It is so simple. Just, and I don't want you to walk away thinking that, and I told this to some of our ladies, don't you talk about, oh, the intercessors. Oh, they're the special group from God. No, you are an intercessor. You can find time. You can tap in and move the hand of God. Anybody can move the hand of God. It's not for just a group of people who are holy and righteous. Don't let anybody fool you with that. You can pray. You want to hear the voice of God. And one of the things I did at the, as a 15-year-old, I said, God, I want to know your voice. That was important to me. I want to know your voice. And believers, you cry out to God to know his voice and to be able to differentiate between his voice and the voices that are going to come to your mind in disguise. You have to know it. And that is from practicing his presence. So I'll challenge you. Prayer is for you too. And whatever you try to do in public, make sure it practice a hundred times in private. That's what I would leave with you. Amen. I feel that prayer mantle dropped. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you so much. Can we give her a round of applause? Thank you for having me. This this was